Q&A with H.G. Tudor. Hello. Yes, it's me, H.G. Tudor. A few days ago, I asked you to pose your various questions, and you've done so in your hundreds. Thank you very much for doing so. I'm going to work my way through as many as I possibly can with a series of responses to the questions that you've posed in order to amuse and enlighten you and give you more insight into me, the way that I think, the way that I function, and my world. If you have further questions that you'd like to ask me, then all you need do is place them in the comments section below this video, and I will, of course, continue to answer questions from the original opening video and questions that you pose underneath this video if you haven't posed a question already. It might be that you hear something in my answers that prompts a question to arise, or you might have a follow-up to something that has been asked and answered. Is your question amongst those that I've selected to be answered? I've gone through picking as many as I possibly can, avoiding repetition where appropriate, taking a range of questions from you. Nothing is off limits. You can ask me anything that you like. So, without further ado, let's get into your questions. Our opening question comes from Pims Pims. What were your school reports like? They were excellent. I was a very good student. I was in the highest stream within my school. I regularly finished in certain subjects with the examinations first, in others, easily within the top five and top ten, even with maths, which is a topic I wasn't particularly keen on. I received a variety of excellent grades on a year-by-year -year basis, and they were reports that, of course, many people would be proud of. There were a couple of instances where the sort of grade B behaviour of my mother leaked into some of my teachers with regard to could do even more, which I think was based upon the potential that they saw in me, notwithstanding the excellence to which I was already achieving. With regard to problems within my personality, well, I remember one school teacher did remark, on what does H.G. base his claim to superiority, which I actually found rather amusing when I saw that was wrote. Uh, there were some comments as well about my aloofness and disdain, but that was just put down to the fact that other people were not in a position to compete with me and that I found certain topics weren't stimulating me. So invariably there were comments along the lines of H.G. is an able student, it is clear, however, that he must apply himself even in topics that don't interest him, which I found a rather moronic observation. Why would I be bothered about something that doesn't interest me and I see no purpose in? Miss M asks, Hi HG, has hostage negotiation ever been part of your professional life? I think you'd make a superb negotiator. I have had situations which would be described as hostage negotiation. I'm not a formal or professional hostage negotiator, but... There have been scenarios in my professional life which have envisaged uh, such an occurrence and there have been instances where I've had to undertake such negotiations. Rox, HG, your videos are a masterclass in content and visual presentation. Thank you very much. Do you have any assistance in their production? When I create the videos, I essentially either narrate material that I had written some time ago, so you get a straight narration. Usually, I pick a topic, and I just talk about it off the cuff, because I know myself and my subject inside out. As you know from instances where I'm talking about other people who might be narcissists or empaths, I will use some source material. So I will read, for example, from an article and provide my observations off the cuff over the top of it. Some instances, I might make a few notes. But largely, when I choose a video topic, I sit down and I talk about it. Naturally, there's research that's undertaken, 
went to a detailed analysis of an individual for the Tudor scope. But for instance, there might be a subject about narcissism. I just sit down and I'll talk about it, sometimes jotting down a few notes, sometimes just talking away. So I don't have any input with regard to the content of what I talk about, other than valuable viewers do make suggestions and make recommendations with regard to articles that they've seen, news articles, journal articles, particular topics, etc., which is great. With regard to videos that people send me, it's only of use to me if, for instance, it's the original video. So here is a video of X doing this. I think this would be useful for you to analyse and it might show somebody who we know is a narcissist engaging in certain behavior so that I can then examine it. What isn't helpful to me is sending me videos of other people's work where they're, for instance, talking about Harry's wife. I haven't got the time to go through those videos and I haven't got the time to put up with what somebody else has to say. If you want to summarize what's in that video and ask me to talk about it, that's fine. You can help me out in that respect. With the thumbnails, they are created by my graphic designer. So what happens there is I tell him what I want, and then he creates it. And he usually gets it spot on first time around sometimes. There's a little bit back and forth between the two of us as we get it settled on what pleases me. Of course, one has to do that within the time constraints of ensuring that the videos are put out. I occasionally get input from my videographer. That's done with regard to sourcing certain videos, which can then be used within the context of um, video analysis. In some instances, she assists with the marrying up of narrative with the video. And in some instances, although I don't do this as often these days, uh, she would assist with putting the sound file through what's called After Effects, in older videos, you remember you'll have seen the uh, coloured bar that moves up and down on the screen. Uh, she uh, created that to go within those videos. So I have a little bit of input with regard to the visuals, and I have a little bit of input with regard to the videography. But beyond that, it's all of your glorious narrator's own work. KR, what's the most annoying question you always get asked, apart from the being being a narcissist exhausting? Well, you're right, actually. That probably is one of the most, I wouldn't say annoying, it's putting a little bit strong, but irritating because it's wrong and I've explained it so many times and people still go, oh, it must be exhausting being a narcissist. I think probably, aside from that, it's would you like to change or would you like to be an empath? No, I don't go around saying to people, oh, you're an empath, you need to change. And I regard it rather rude when people suggest to me that I... Uh, would like to change. Remember, I'm entirely effective as what I am. I like what I am. I get it that the people think I should change, but I don't want to, and people ought to recognise that. Raya asks, which person, if any have been through the Tudor scope and either surprised you or intrigued you the most? I don't think anybody has surprised me. I think the one that did intrigue me the most was ascertaining what Johnny Depp is. Um, because there was a huge amount of material, and of course it was very prevalent with his trial with Amber Heard, and also because of the level of interest that people had in the outcome. Also what was intri intriguing me was, of course, the difference of views. People thinking he's a narcissist, other people saying, no, definitely he's an empath, and the quite partisan lines that were drawn up. So I think that was the one that intrigued me the most. Titian asks, HG, in the movie of your life, which actor would you choose to portray you? Which actors, actresses would you choose to portray your fuel sources? Excellent question. I think in terms of the um, portrayal of um, me, Daniel Craig, when he played Bond, because that's probably the closest to me in terms of demeanour. I'm not suggesting that I'm James Bond, but of course Bond is a narcissistic psychopath and his portrayal was very good in that he demonstrated that um, individual that was able to draw people to him but never connected to anyone. The, was it Vesper? 
that that wasn't as close to the portrayal of me as uh, you'd ordinarily find. But in terms of that sort of taciturn approach with the dry humour, um, the liking for violence, the dismissiveness, the manner in which he analysed situations, I think there was a closeness there and there is a physical resemblance also. Alternatively, I choose Christian Bale because he's such a diverse and versatile actor. He's absolutely brilliant and because he's one of my favourite actors, it would be a personal delight to have him portray me. As to my fuel sources, well, there are thousands of them, so we'd be looking at a cast of thousands. I suppose if we were limiting it to uh, former intimate partner primary sources and notable non-intimate secondary sources, so family members and friends and uh, people that I've disincentivized, and intimate partner secondary sources, there's still a lot of them. But names that I would want would be on the female side, Uma Thurman, Kate Blanchard, Christina Hendricks, Penelope Cruz, Helen Mirren, she could play Matronarch, Vicky McClure, British actress, she'd play my sister, Kate Winslet, Hayam Abbas, Judy Greer, Francis McDormand, Charlize Theron, Scarlett Johansson, Emily Blunt, Reese Witherspoon. As for the men, Jim Carter, Paddy Considine, Sam Rockwell, John Slattery, Bob Odenkirk, Richard Roxburgh, Gary Oldman, Stephen Graham, Jesse Plemons, Bill Camp, Colman Domingo, Javier Bardem, Benicio Del Toro, Tom Wilkinson, Damien Lewis, Stephen Root, Michael Gambon. Quite a diverse range, because of course there are a diverse range of fuel sources that I've engaged with. So, what great question there. Melissa Holman, I've always wondered how you find the time to upload so often on top of everything else you do. What is your daily routine as far as work goes? Well, it actually varies dependent upon what's happening with uh, what I do professionally. There are some instances where I am effectively in the field, although that happens less these days, where I would be off-grid. Typical days, I rise around about 5 a.m., exercise, shower, etc., go through the old routine there, have my breakfast, and then I get on with professional work, which might be, for instance, uh, meetings, telephone calls, analysis, uh, carrying out uh, active field work. And if it's the... Last thing, that means that it well may well be the case, for instance, that with videos, etc., there won't be any, or I put up some old ones. And I put up the old ones because I've got so many of them. Often people don't go through the archives, and it enables a new audience, because, of course, I'm getting new people coming to my work all of the time to see this work. I also do it as well because some people will find new things in it. They'll have moved on in their journey dealing with narcissists and they'll find something new in the material. So that's why sometimes I repeat it. It's convenient for me to rely upon an existing extensive stock of material, but also many people haven't necessarily experienced it the first time around, or if they have, they'll find something new in it. So there'll be some days where I will sit down and narrate the material and, of course, do all of the other stuff that I do in relation to what I call blog world. So setting up my blog, moderating comments, uh, answering emails, undertaking consultations with people. Some days I won't do consultations because I'm too busy with my professional stuff and private stuff. Some days I won't do anything that's related to uh, videos and blogs. Some days I prepare it in advance, so it's scheduled to go out whilst I'm busy doing other professional things, travelling, etc. I'm able to get so much done because I'm a swift decision maker, I am focused, I don't engage in redundant behaviours, I know what I want to achieve, I delegate certain tasks, I don't need a lot of sleep, and accordingly I can pack a lot in. Bunch House, how very generous of you to post this opportunity, AG, you're welcome. Are majority schools of empath formed through a genetic predisposition, or is it more from the environment? Well, it won't be a surprise for you to find that it's a combination of the two, and I will be addressing this in greater detail when I undertake my work uh, that's ongoing in relation to more material about the various schools and cadres of empaths. Where Rosemary Flourishes, delightful name, is there a psychopath, hybrid or narcissist you would be wary of taking on in a battle of manipulative wits? 
I wouldn't say that there's anybody that I would be wary of taking on. Of course, there are individuals where one perhaps requires a greater level of thought compared to others. Uh, that would naturally be where I'm dealing with a greater. But with mid-range and lesser, one is never foolish, but they wouldn't necessitate uh, a greater level of input and preparation even though, of course, I always adopt the mantra of every battle is won before it's ever fought, the level of preparation needed for less from mid-range narcissists is far less. But I'm not wary of taking on anybody. Mocha, have you ever thought of writing your life's adventures, be it true semi-fiction, because you certainly know how to keep us interested? Thank you very much for that compliment. Well, I've written a little about my adventures in the blog, so you can find those and is interwoven in some of the existing videos, Mocha. I think, though, going into more of the detail of what I've done professionally, I can't at the moment for reasons of confidentiality and protecting my identity. Perhaps when I'm nearing my dotage, which is a long way off, um, then I might consider more when I've stopped doing what I do professionally that I would then turn to telling more about what's gone on in respect of that because it's fascinating and people will find it hugely interesting. Dorothy Reed, if narcissists believe the lies they tell, how can body language experts tell that they're lying? They can't. They invariably get it wrong. That's why I often explain that whilst these body language experts are probably very skilled in relation to interpreting the behaviours of non-narcissists, when it comes to dealing with narcissists, they often get it wrong because they don't understand narcissism. That's fair enough. I don't claim to necessarily know everything there is to know about body language. I know something because of what I do professionally and the way that I've been trained. And, of course, I know the body language of narcissists because of what I am and what I talk about. But many of the body languages get it, experts get it wrong in that regard because they don't understand narcissism. And they'd be better off sticking to interpreting the behaviours of non-narcissists rather than jumping on bandwagons. Poet Louis, Lady Louise, Louisa of Wit's End. What a title that is. H.G., if you could time travel only once, to which historical era would you jump? Interesting question. I think there are so many that I would like to, to go to, in all honesty. Um, but if I was to narrow it down, I think the first would be Edward I's time, which was in the, the bulk of which his life was in the 13th century. He was the first son of Henry III and Eleanor of Provence. And you might well know him as Edward Longshanks because he was very tall. And he uh, was taken a hostage following the Battle of Lewes. And he... Battle of Lewes, rather. And he battled rebels uh, in 1265 when Simon de Montfort initiated the Great Parliament. He, of course, went on a crusade and he wanted to, Longshanks wanted to rule Edward, Wales, uh, England rather, Wales and Scotland. And he invaded Wales and defeated the Welsh leader. And, of course, there was the Battle of Falkirk. And I rather like the words on Edward Longshanks' tomb, uh, Hammer of the Scots, keep the faith, which I find quite entertaining. So there's a varied life, and in the medieval times, which is something that's interested me. And then also Charles II, uh, his time period, which was uh, during his life, which was 1630 to 1685, was when he lived. Because, of course, he was the eldest surviving child of Charles I, who you sh may well know was the only British monarch that has been executed in 1649. And he had to flee to safety in France with his mother, where she was living in exile. And then he engaged in conflict with Oliver Cromwell, but he was defeated at the Battle of Worcester, fled to mainland Europe, spent nine years exiled in France, the Dutch Republic, the Spanish Netherlands. And then when Cromwell died and the monarchy was restored, Charles was invited to return and he assumed the throne in the Restoration in 1660. So he had a very uh, varied and interesting life overseeing what was a particularly interesting time period for British history. So I think those were two of the periods that I would like to have been in and amongst, although, of course, there are many one could choose from. So thank you for that uh, interesting question. Party of One, HG, I can honestly say you're better than the majority of psychologists out there. 
Thank you for that. High praise indeed, which uh, I roundly accept. Do you have any interest in becoming a licensed therapist? No, I don't. I'm able to do what I do without having to ha have somebody lying on a couch and me asking them, how does that make you feel? Now, in all seriousness, I see no need for me to do that. It doesn't interest me. And I can continue to do what I do without the restrictions of being a licensed therapist and thus be far more effective as you've acknowledged yourself in your kind compliment. Orwell was right about the left. Can you tell us some well-known people who are ultras? I can only tell you one, me. And I'm not that well-known in terms of who I am. I'm not particularly famous. I'm well-known within certain circles, but I'm not internationally famous. There's only one ultra, and that's me. Caroline Varangers, why did you wipe your prints off the restroom handle when you first met the wife? I didn't. I didn't say that I wiped my prints. I said I used a tissue on the door handle, and reason being is there are certain individuals who are rather grotty, and they don't wash their hands. So whenever I exit the restroom, I use a tissue so I don't pick up their germs. My health is very important to me. I can't spend my time feeling unwell. Occasionally I have become unwell, but a lot of the time I'm not. And I don't want to take that risk because it would stop me doing what I need to do. And there's so much that needs to be done. So because of the unpleasant habits of other individuals... I utilise a tissue so I don't have to touch the germ-ridden handle and just deal with the tissue which I then dispose of. I regularly also utilise... Uh, I carry a uh, hand gel with me to clean my hands as well. And if you were ever to visit my house, I'm particularly I am most particular about hygiene and cleanliness. STST, if you had to live on an island with only narcissists, which group of narcissists would you choose to live the rest of your life with and why? Well, I can tell you who wouldn't be on there, mid-rangers. Um, upper lesser A would be quite amusing, but after a while one would get bored of them. I'd have to choose, if, I, if you're allowing me to go by either lesser, mid-range or greater, I would have to choose greater, because they'd be far more interesting, far more resourceful, and there'd be a recognition because we'd all know we'd all recognize one another. So I would find that uh, far more interesting and stimulating. Julia Getman, what has been your longest intimate part, intimate primary source relationship? Four and a half years. I know that somebody answered for me saying three years. I think they were referencing how long I'd been married because that was uh, the answer to that. Did I, when I was married, it was three years. But uh, no, it's four and a half years. Sandro Sensai, uh, what is the one thing you regret in your life? Have you done anything you've done regretting in the end? No, I don't have any regrets. Every decision I've made has been the right decision. I don't do regret. It's pointless. K. Grant, assuming that you have left a wake of hurt people as narcissists do, Yes, but they deserved it. Have you ever owned up to your wounding of them, apologised and made restitution? And if so, how? Apologies if too complex for this exercise. Of course, you would then merely ignore the question. No, not at all. It isn't complex at all. The simple answer is, I've not owned up to my wounding of them. I have nothing to apologise for, and there's no need to make restitution. Gigi Bean, are your friends aware that you're a narcissistic psychopath? No, they're not. Therefore, your second question where you ask, and if so, are they cautious in their friendships with you? They're not cautious of me because I'm a narcissistic psychopath. They, certain of them, have a degree of caution because they know, as they have said, HG, you have edge. Noel, Noel, we're meeting someone for the first time. How long does it take you to realise they are your kind, an ultra? It doesn't take me any time at all because there is only one ultra, and that's me, so I don't meet any other ultras. Fly Grace, what has made you laugh the most? Could be a joke, a comedy sketch, a witty retort, something you saw in real life, anything. Well, <clears throat> I think there's probably three things that spring to mind. First, many years ago, I was in a shopping centre with a friend, and it was a place selling electronics, if I remember correctly. And we watched as a man strode very purposefully and I think that's what first caught my eye. He wasn't ambling along like many people do, so you want to punch them in the back of the head so they'll go faster or get out of your way. He was striding with great purpose towards the store in which we were stood. And 
he looked like he was perhaps in a rush or maybe he just naturally walked that way. But as he was doing so, he didn't realise that of the two glass doors, one was open and one was closed. And he walked straight into the one which was closed. And he bounced off it and made such a strange noise, which was a kind of like, oh, almost like a cartoon noise. And he left a smear where his nose had bashed against the door. And the manner in which he was walking so furiously, pummeled against the door, bounced off it, made a strange noise and then fell to the floor, was rather amusing. He was all right, by the way. Those of you that be worrying about he was hurt, he was fine, just a little bit dazed. But it was uh, particularly amusing. And I have to say my friends who are not narcissistic psychopaths also found it hugely amusing. The second occasion will have been, I was vastly amused at the inadequacies and futile attempts of a competitor to land a blow on me. I can't really tell you any more than that without giving away information about my identity. But that made me laugh considerably. And then perhaps in a more conventional way that you would understand, as opposed to uh, the other examples that I've given, the performance of Matt Berry as Toast of London I found highly amusing also. That brings to a conclusion this part of H.G. Tudor question and answer. Thank you for the submission of your questions, and well done to those of you who had your questions answered. But there's plenty more for me to get through. You've been most industrious. So join me in the next Ask H.G. Tudor, which will be coming along very soon. Please do ensure that you like this video. If you haven't already subscribed, please do so. And get it shared so more people can share in the knowledge and be entertained at the same time. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.